Hi everyone, we're live again coding React applications and API gateway today. And we are going to work through all the details of coding API gateway and um, all that's necessary to build a very cool API on top of AWS. So before we get into API delivery, just let me check that everything is okay. So it seems to be good and through. So let me just refresh and make a quick uh, check. And we seem to be live. Yeah, we're live. So before we get into the API, let me review what we did in the last session for those of you who were not here. So in the last broadcast, we and let me just mute this, just a second. And I can, just a sec, let me just get this out of my sight. And okay, so if we, Just a second, guys. I'm having just a small problem with the chat, Twitch chat in just a second. Well, I hope everything's okay for you guys. Let me know if you can't hear or if you can't reach to me. Just let me know. Well, and here in the last broadcast, this is the this is the Twitch for today. Just let me paste this to you guys. So this is what we should be building today. And last time we decided to create a fresh project and start from scratch. So we created this open source project, just a pet project. It could be really literally anything. It's called breakless and it is uh, it will be probably about bikes and cyclists because that's my hobby but it could be literally anything that you guys want and if there's anything different anything at all that you guys would like to see built just let me know and we'll get it on the broadcast and we talked then about the AWS console CLI and JavaScript SDKs and we are going to be needing that a lot today. So just for review, in console.awsamazon.com, we have the AWS console, and that's the most important tool we will be using today. And most of the create operations and anything at all that AWS provides is here and today we're going to use a lot of API gateway and Lambda, but we later in this broadcast we're going to address most of the services that you're seeing here. And this this AWS CLI you can find at aws.amazon.com slash CLI and we're going to use this to automate all of our operations and this is going, I hope the, let me just get a microphone so the audio doesn't look. Just a second, I'm, I'll be right back. I'm still here, don't go anywhere. I think this should fix my sound problem. Okay, so we're back. And just to demonstrate to you guys what the AWS CLI is, I will open my terminal and just get this a bit bigger. Choose my AWS default profile. I have several profiles set for several accounts. You can do that with the AWS CLI. And if I do, for example, AWS S3 LS, this is the list command. Well, I must have done something a bit 
room here. I have an alias for the same thing and AWS S3 LS should give me the list of my, my buckets. This is the list of buckets that I am currently using. On the console, you can see that this is exactly the same thing as if I was to go in the S3 console and look through the, through the contents and you see that this is exactly the same as we saw on the, on the, on the console. And another option that we will use today is the AWS JavaScript SDK. And if we take a look at that, uh, let me get to the API docs. There is the API documentation. And here you can find the S3 class. And the S3 class will have a method called list buckets. And it will list the bucket. And it will, would be the same thing in a JavaScript program. So the idea is that all AWS services are, be, are just HTTP services and you have these three different clients to it. You have the console, the CLI or the SDKs, but in the end, it's going to access the very same services with the very same rules and the very same data, all right? And after that, what we did was store some static content on S3. So if we take a look at this bucket, S3 broad breakless bike, we have um, a small application there. We have an index.html file and some assets. And this, is, this code is exactly the same that you see on the on the project on the on the open source project we started by creating a jekyll app then we created a react application and here is how to uh, to run and the content in the bucket is the very same as in public here i should probably should not have committed this i'll, I'll add this to git ignore but well that's it and we then move it on to two types of content delivery regional delivery and global delivery so if you got it, this is will be important today so let me just review that all aws services are available on aws.amazon.com products and their description and just below that you see this map showing the global network of regions and edge locations and when you provision a bucket, you choose a region for it, and it could be in the US or in Europe or in Asia or in Brazil, but delivery from that bucket will always be out of that region. This means that if your user is far away, for example, if you host your bucket in the US and your user is in, in Europe, it will be probably a higher latency. That's why we have this lots of blue dots. Those are the edge locations that our CDN uses to deliver content. That's what CloudFront does. And we saw how to create that on the last episode. And it is on the console, on CloudFront. You can pick your distribution or the distribution we created. So this is the URL. And you can see here that in origins, it's pointing to that very same bucket. And in behaviors, all, all requests are being directly straight to that, to that bucket. And if we hit that URL, you see that our application is up and running. And this is not a special application at all. It was just created with 
React create project. So it was just a file new from this, from create React app. Just if you would like, you can use this very same commands to do exactly the same thing and you will be on the same step that we are right now, okay? So this is what we built last time, okay? And let me see just if there is any, any detail. We talked about cache, expiration, and other static website engines, and this is pretty much it. So let, let me know if you guys have any questions by now before we move on to create the APIs, just um, ping me here in Twitch chat and let me know what you guys would like to see or else I'll just move on to the API part of our broadcast today. So uh, the thing with our application so far is that it is completely static. So S3, does not perform any type of computation. It's just getting what is on disk and shipping to the cables and fire showing up on our browser, but it's not processing JavaScript, Java, PHP, or any kind of language. For that, we need a compute element. And there are a lot of options for computing on AWS here on the, on the console we can see several compute services. EC2 for virtual machines on the cloud, EC2 container service for Docker containers, LightSail for a simplifying and more straightforward launch of instances, but backed by the same resources as EC2. Beanstalk, it's a completely automated DevOps management tool. We may talk a lot about that in the future and batch to move to batch processing applications and things that we will want to do offline. But today we're going to talk about AWS Lambda. And this is a very, very special case because it is probably the most cost effective and the simplest way to build compute on AWS today. And there is um, a lot to know and let's get to it. So the first thing when you to understand is with Lambda, you're not spinning virtual machines, you're not spinning Docker containers, you're just firing up your own functions and that's a service. So this is probably the smallest service you can have straightforward a function. And when we create a Lambda function, we have several blueprints of lots of functions that are available for you, for example, to process streams from of data from DynamoDB, to get objects from S3, to modify uh, responses directly from CloudFront, to create Alexa skills, lots and lots of cases and scenarios that you can build with AWS Lambda. I will choose the blank function and just proceed with the full settings. So I will let's say hello twitch or a functional name and the description could be very much the same and uh, a very good news that i have for you today is that we announced node.js 6.10 just this morning and node.js is in, what's the difference uh, why, why would you care if it's node.js 6 or 4.3 well, if you check on node.green, you find the support for JavaScript language features. And you can see that on 6.10, you have much more support for ES6 and the more advanced and newer syntax of the JavaScript language. So you don't use to, you don't need to use transpilers such as Babel to get these features that before was necessary. So very good news that we have uh, Node.js 6 today. And here is your code directly from, from Lambda. And this could be literally anything. In this code, you could query your database, 
reach to another service open whatever kind of files running the shell you can literally do anything you can do in regular node.js and the aws libraries are already included for you in this context so let's just leave this hello from twitch just so we can change some, something and we can take advantage of console.log that will go straight to cloudwatch logs and let me log just a simple string so you guys see what's going on hello twitch log and there are we are going to inspect this object and parameters a bit afterwards okay so and this is as all it takes to build a lambda function quite simple and we have some advanced topics here that we're not messing much with this function now but you can enable encryption so that this environment variables that you pass to the function are encrypted and this would if you're just passing configuration this is not much of a big deal but if your environment variables includes credentials such as your database password it may be a good idea to enable those encryption okay and following that we need to set a role for our lambda function so uh, you can we can use an existing role or create a new role i will just create a new from a template and my role will be the twitch role and it could be literally anything and here is what this function is going to be able to do so i will just move on with the basic permissions for um, for execution there should be one simple microservice permissions should be all right and after that the first thing is memory how much memory your function is allowed to use and this is very very important because the amount of resources of memory and and compute will be determined by these settings you can set from 128 megs of memory up to a gig and a half and this is important so you can do more um, advanced computations okay and here in the pricing page in aws amazon.com slash lambda oops uh, let's let's talk a bit about pricing so not on the spanish page but on pricing here's the pricing for aws lambda and this is probably the a very very important part for everyone and let me make clear what this means so here is the how are you charged for aws lambda the duration is calculated by millisecond gigabyte seconds so you're charged a fraction of a penny this fraction exactly and this is for every gigabyte per second that you use so for example if you have 128 megabytes of memory and run this fu this function over over and over again you have this price and along the along the same lines you see how how this idea goes and yeah the way to, the best way to understand this is to see this pricing examples so if you have um, this many uh, invocations and at these fractions of a penny you will see that this 3 million invocations with 500 uh, megabytes would up, amount up to 18 dollars or so so the why is it so cheap well the the idea is that no resources are provisioned while your function is not running so your function will only run when there is a request to it so it's 
as cost effective as possible. You don't keep a machine there doing nothing, sitting idle while there is no need. So this is the, the, uh, the whole idea of Lambda. And if for any reason your AWS Lambda function fails to be invocated, you can set a resource to have the, the error sent to, you can send it to a message queue and process this later. And you also have the timeout. You can set how, how much time, I believe up to five minutes that your function is allowed to run, okay? And it can also run on your VPC, and this is quite important if you want your Lambda function to access resources that lives on your VPC, such as your RDS database or your API gateway and things like that, or your DynamoDB tables, whatever, whatever exists and is accessible from your VPC, you can make your Lambda functions live there. And for the environment variables encryption, you can use the key from KMS. I will leave this all with the full settings and just go for the next and create our function. So now we can execute this as soon as it's created. We can test this using the console and see that we have the sample event template. This will be passed as a parameter to your function and just save and test. And here we can see that this function took two milliseconds to run. It's built for 100 milliseconds. It's always rounded up to the nearest 100 milliseconds and it used 16 megs of memory and just the just the the node environment and the log output will be placed here and you can always see here in cloud near cloudwatch log groups that that those logs so let's see here the the message that we just logged so we you don't need to worry with log shipping, with uh, spending uh, more than you should, or any of those things using AWS Lambda. It, this is um, an incredible, incredibly efficient resource. And so this is why we're making use of that today. But in further broadcasts, we can surely use regular instances and deploy APIs using Jax RS or Vertex or whichever microservices framework you guys would like to see, okay? And so this is AWS Lambda, okay? And once you have your functions configured here in the AWS um, API, the AWS JavaScript API, you, or the AWS console, or the very same ways that we did here, you can also invoke your Lambda functions. So, for example, in the AWS CLI, there is a resource for performing Lambda operations. So, everything that we did on the console we could easily done on the command line. And one very important operation is invoke. So using AWS Lambda CLI, AWS Lambda invoke, you just pass your uh, function name and some optional parameters and you can uh, invoke your Lambda functions from the command line. Or if you're using JavaScript SDK, There is also the invoke operation and with the same very same parameters and using this you can invoke your lambda function directly from your script from your Node.js scripts and although they, this is very useful for a lot of contexts 
this is not the best for web applications not to invoke this directly because you probably want some more controls when you're publishing uh, APIs, especially if those APIs are public. So let's see how that can be done. And again, let me know guys if you have any questions or uh, and information. And Quantum Information, thank you for your comments. We do have promises and all the ES6 features on on Lambda now with Node 6 and you can uh, I don't I'm not sure what you mean by ES6 export but let's just check on Node Green everything that's on the 610 column you can use it's this very same version and features okay and now let's talk a bit about API gateway so Publishing APIs is very important nowadays for everybody's publishing API. I just saw a very uh, interesting case from Amsterdam that their airport is publishing an API. So we have for here, for example, the Schiphol Airport flight APIs so you can get and see what's going on in that specific airport. And the idea is very clear. Using APIs and publishing APIs to expose your rules and data, you can make your business available to contexts and developers worldwide and extend it to scenarios that you didn't even thought were possible initially. So if you expose it further than your application and let people use your systems, this may be really, really interesting and deliver quite very interesting results. For example, uh, in Brazil, where there is an open, an open data movement and laws such as um, laws to enforce that data is being public, there is this operation called Serenata de Amor. <laughs> it's hard to fake your own accent, but uh, it's another very interesting case of artificial intelligence consuming APIs and trying to fiscalize the public administration using publicly available APIs and data. So this has led to tremendous savings. It's helping judges and courts and making uh, a huge progress in transparency for public administration in Brazil, which is kind of very important, especially considering the, the times that we are living right now. So this is one, um, this is why APIs are important, but they are in fact quite hard to build. If you take a look at AWS APIs and how we do things, there is um, a very, very important stuff such as authentication. Let me show you AWS SIGV4. That's our signature process. So to access our APIs, you have to sign your requests. And this is the process by, by which it, it is done. Let me just uh, show you guys what it looks like. So you have to create this canonical request, taking the headers and generating a signature from it according to the specifications and a lot and a lot of care just to make sure that our APIs are secure. And uh, uh, just having an API key is definitely not enough for, for security. And uh, this and many other things such as throttling and caching and whatnot, is it's, it may be quite complicated. So that's why AWS launched API Gateway. So let's take a look at API Gateway now. So here on API Gateway, we can create APIs that make our data accessible. I will just take um, one example. It could be a Lambda example. It could be literally anything. 
And the idea is that you can create resources such as um, names on that you're going to access and map those HTTP methods and parameters to your backends. And your backends could be literally anything. Here in this case, the backend is a Lambda function, but it could be any other API. So this is a very important thing, not only for new applications, but is a very good tool for legacy transformations. So if you start putting your legacy behind those APIs, you can expose and then maybe migrate or change what is on the backend much more easily. So API Gateway will do that and it will add a lot of features. It have transformations. You can map uh, what's coming in the request. If it's not the same thing that your backend service expects, you can transform. For example, if you have one JSON format in your client and one another JSON format on, or even XML, for example, on your backend, you can map between those formats using this integration requests and setting a API gateway for, for those cases. And more than that, it really helps getting those things out safely. For example, here in broad, this is the stage. You can have as many stages as you'd like. You can have um, pre-production, testing, um, gamma, alpha, whatever, how many of those you'd like. And here you can create settings for those methods so you can enable caching for those methods use CloudWatch logs and detailed metrics and one very important thing is throttling so if you're um, how do you prevent abuse right so how do you cope with people hammering your apis well there's a lot of techniques for this you could you can use captchas and whatnot but here you can rate the you can limit the rate at which requests are being fired at you or even burst uh, accept up to a maximum burst of a given number of requests and also uh, use client certificates if you're or authenticating with client certificates you can have stage variables that are going to be passed to your mapping contact to your mappings and one feature that we are going to use today is the SDK generation. So using the SDK generator, you can generate the client's libraries for Android, JavaScript, iOS, Objective-C or Swift, and Java. The, the, this meaning that your client library is automatically generated. So you don't need to map those request methods to other things or, or manually create those clients and worry with, about things such as retries when you uh, use for when you generate your sdk for your for your api it's going to include all those things for example it will include exponential back off for retries if for whatever reason your invocation fails and things like that so um this is what api gateway looks like and one important thing to understand about api gateway it's that it's not restricted to lambda it could literally connect any kind of api with any kind of back-end service and there there are lots of features and configurations on api gateway for that and we are going to explore that in the next uh, the next moment so let's let's move on and add that to our application so just let's just start by creating a lambda function publishing it as an api and get it working in our in our context okay so uh, let's Another, just a thing that I forgot to mention here in the Lambda console. Let me, let me show you guys that 
here we, ha we have that configuration, the same settings that we did, but I'd like to show you triggers and monitoring. Triggers is how this function is going to be called. When you add a trigger, you can have an API gateway as we were discussing, but there are several other AWS services that can invoke your Lambda function. For example, AWS IoT, meaning that when you click a button on your Raspberry Pi or your Intel Edison, it's going to access AWS IoT and it can in turn fire your Lambda function. Or for example, on DynamoDB, when you add a new entry on your dat database, a new item, you can fire um, Lambda as if it was a NoSQL trigger or something like this. When you have data arrive in your, kin in your Kinesis streams, it can be processed by your Lambda functions. And when you have new files or any S3 event, you can also trigger that to your Lambda function. And this is very useful, for example, if you want to generate thumbnails of the images that are uploaded to your S3 bucket and, and things like that. Yeah, and I really like the AWS IoT integration as well. And thanks for reminding me in quantum information. This is something that we are working a lot. And there is even a thing called AWS Greengrass. So let me just uh, for a second, let me show you this AWS Greengrass. So AWS Greengrass is an IoT service for um, local compute, meaning that if you have a case that cannot depend on internet connectivity, such as, uh, for example, you're in a hospital monitoring hospital equipment, and if there is an alarm, you can't wait for the network latency or even if the internet is down. So maybe you need to react locally. And AWS Greengrass takes Lambda functions to the edge, to those very devices, and it's the very same programming model. So you can uh, host those Lambda functions even on Greengrass devices. So this allows you to use the same programming model, the same APIs to integrate with, the, with your backend server services or with your uh, IoT devices and whatnot. So, this is pretty pretty interesting okay take a look if you are interested in iot i highly recommend you take a look at green grass and, and lambda as well so here you can of course add to aws an api endpoint and create uh, this lambda function choose your security which could use iam credentials be open to the internet or just one simple access key and when you submit this it will provide you with an endpoint and this is what you can use to invocate to invoke this function okay uh, let's see if this if this works yeah and that there's probably an error i did it this to uh loosely i don't know what i done wrong here but we can we will make we will go through all the steps uh in more with more care in the following section okay and here in the metrics such as how many times this was invoked how much it lasts if it had errors if it was throttled if you had dl key messages and things like this and even again your logs on cloudwatch logs okay yeah, so let's move, let's, uh, let's go and just start creating um, our API for our application. So before that, we need to start our app. It's on my local machine on dev. It's called Breakless and Breakless React. So this is our JavaScript project and npm start should get it running okay so 
uh, it's already running somewhere. Let me run it in another port. And here we go. So this is our initial AWS Twitch app. And let me close this other tabs to the right here. Okay, and now let's add it. Let's open this in Atom, just so we have a text editor. And this is our, this was all generated by uh, Create App, by React Create App. The only thing I did is change the, the welcome message, right? It could be literally anything. And let's start creating our API. So I'd like to add to this page any kind of dynamic information and we'll get to, to that in a second, okay? So let me just open. Let's start by creating our API. So let's see how that can be done. In, let's go to the console and I'll create a new Lambda function. Create a new blank function. I'll go again with the very same details and that what would be a descriptive name for our operation. So I will, it, it's weird to have an application without much requirements for us, but I'd like to show you that this is relevant to any case, but now we probably need to think of uh, things that we would like to to display in our, what would we, would we like to display on our homepage? So let's, um, let's think if this is a bike app, we probably want bike pictures, bike routes, um, featured uh, items. Let's start with uh, pictures and featured things. It could be literally anything at all. So I will call this function list uh, featured items, for example. And list items featured on the home page. And now we, we're going to have um, a small difference from our previous case is the, the callback, the, the data that we want here is probably not a string. If we're talking, if we are talking about um, items and um, we want to have this in a JSON array or, or something like this, right? We have uh, items, for example, this is what we would like, we would like to return. It's going to be an array and it can have item one, item two, and item three. And let's say that ID is one and two and three, something like this, right? Well, this would be good, but it doesn't work quite like that. So just to make it easier, I'll call this result and make var result equals this items. And this would be what we want to pass, but we can't go just this way because we have some requirements from API Gateway. So because we don't want to map all those requirements, uh, map, make all those mappings from requests to responses and all those things, we need to, we can configure this proxy integration for resources. And when you create proxy integrations on API Gateway, 
this will uh, pass all the requests from a given API directly to the backend with pretty fine mapping so you don't need to map each and every request but there are a few uh, quirks <laughs> a few peculiar things about this especially when working with AWS Lambda and this is the page that you should look when you're doing this for your own app creating an application an API gateway as a Lambda proxy because this will show you everything that is going on and that we will do right now it shows a, a calculation template with path parameters and things like this but what I want to show you guys is this this template and this requirement from API gateway so let me just find where this where this is you really need to there is a special format that you need to follow on your responses when you're behind API gateway let me see if I can find that that response this is by this is mapping the the inputs uh, it's a very specific JSON file and a JSON format you have to pass the resources and the, and the, the headers and everything in a very specific way here it is so this is the output format that a lambda function must output to integrate with uh, with API gateway with proxy integration you have to send the status code that API gateway is going to deliver the headers that are going to be added and the body of your and the actual response that you want to ship as a string so actually this is the JSON that you need to output from your lambda function there are a couple of different ways to do this but I guess this is the, the simplest form okay so let's just go ahead and set this up so this um, the, so this will be the response and I'll just ship that response so let's say that status code would be 200 and for the for the headers we're going to see that there's lots of important HTTP headers to think about for now we're going to use just content type and we're going we're we're working with json so application slash json okay and there are a couple different ways to code lambda functions i don't we, you probably want to use an ide and we are going to move this code to a more structured format i just want to move on very slowly and show you piece by piece how it works so you don't think there is there is no magic at all going on and um, for the for the body we can just json dot stringify this okay so this is all we need for our lambda function and let's move on oh the role we always need to set the role and I will use the I'll create choose an existing role and let's pick that lambda basic execution again this role is just to say what your lambda function can do which resources it can access and you can we are going to learn about IAM policies and how to build them but for now let's just keep this as a basic execution that doesn't have access to many things okay and now our function is created and let's test it so just save and test 
huh, there is something wrong going here let's see what uh, what I'm missing unexpected token uh, online it's probably here right this this one okay. so those semicolons always the same columns so yeah we have the oh and this won't work its result so always make sure you test your lambda functions i probably should be using uh, J, uh js unit testing framework i don't know which one you guys prefer but we are going to be more careful about testing but just this is just a quick way to 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 check that thanks thanks eric <laughs> we got that um okay so our lambda function is up and running so let's now create an api for that and here we can make this public and create the just here is easier, easier so we don't have to type this every time and api gateway so i will create an api and you call it my breakless api and a new resource and this will configure this as a proxy resource and i will add everything pass everything to my lambda function so let's call it what was it list items list featured items yep list featured list featured items i will use the same uh, i will use the featured items as a resource and it is very important that you enable cross origin requests if you're not serving them from the same endpoint and in a future broadcast we're going to talk about how to make the static and dynamic under the same names but for now we're probably going to use cores and if other applications in other origins are accessing your app you also want cores so this is highly recommended so let's just one and use and create this resource so what am i missing here and hmm let's do this again so i will create a method it's going to be a get method oh okay and it's going to be calling uh, oops it's this is on 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 the root so again create a resource first this is going to be a proxy resource and uh, or I don't need uh, I don't know if that is, this is necessary I don't think let's not configure this as a proxy resource um, the idea is that a proxy resource will forward any method on the HTTP any HTTP method and let's work method by method I think this will be easier to understand so let's get those featured items resource and gateway but without being a proxy resource so it does create this options request as um, uh, as we enabled course course uses a pref preflight request to make sure your origins are acceptable so we can we can you, you can configure which options and which domains you want to allow or not but just let's go with the full settings and make this api public so now we can create an, another method on this api that's going to be a get request 
With get requests, we can get the, the lambda function to work, or we can use other kinds of backends. Now we're going to use a lambda function, but we could use HTTP to request another HTTP endpoint. We could have a mock service, just if you want to return static or very simple responses while you test your service and make it available immediately while you code the rest or you can ship the request directly to another AWS service. So think, for example, that you'd like to ship data directly into DynamoDB. So you could choose DynamoDB as an AWS service and just fire requests that way. But this would still be under the management of the API gateway, okay? And now with um, Lambda function, I will use the Lambda proxy integration, and this is all on US list one, and our Lambda function is list featured items. So yes, I'm about to give permissions to that, and here is our invocation pipeline for this, for this method, okay? And right, now this is ready for deployment. We are going to deploy this API. And this is the most common mistake and the most common issue in API gateway, re re forgetting, making changes and forgetting to deploy. So always remember to deploy your changes. And we, we're go we don't have a stage yet, so I'm going to create a new one. Let's call it just production or just prod. Um, live and running and this is deployed at okay so that we have this we have our invoke URL here and so if I did everything correctly which is a very small chance and we ship a, a get request to uh, to that resource featured items was it was this it missing authentication token hmm what am i going wrong here so <laughs> yeah I, I will use serverless in a, in a couple minutes. I, we're going to get to that, but let's see what am I doing wrong here. Hmm. So I have this public API for cheating and let's see what this get method looks like. And it's known proxy, everything looks okay. Let's just let me look if everything's all right here and this should be should be working hmm. live debugging right that's why we are here and well oh i think i know what this is and the featured items i don't know I don't need this mapping. I can remove this. It's probably not that, but let's check. And deploy the API to prod deploy. No, really not that. Just let's double check if it's not a browser thing, see if we have the same thing for curl. Hmm. Why? 
One way to, to, to understand and help us debug is to fire requests from the, from the API. So here on the, on the method, you can test it straight from the, from the console. Just let me change this for one second and put this to charge. So let's see if we can fire this and test directly here. So the, it is coming back, it is coming back okay, and it's returning from the, from the API gateway with the correct body and correct invocation. Hmm. So, As this is a public API, this should not be a thing going on. I don't know what, why we are, we are getting this response. Hmm. Well, another, another way we can test this is generating the, the client SDKs, but I don't know if, if this is going to work. Let, let's try to get this working first. Let's check if my other method that was working right before is going on or if I'm making something totally different. Yes, I, I did test this. It's just a, diff, a test case that I built earlier. It's called load featured and this should work. Hmm. So this other method is working fine so let's see what I'm doing differently. So I will go to the API gateway and just check that the options method is correct. On the resources on get. So let's check everything. So options, is on a mock request and mapping to an empty and get is on Lambda proxy and mapping like this. So let's see if I can do the same thing and just check if the Lambda functions are, are pretty similar. So in the, with the breakless featured items, I will see the, the pre-flight, the get request is pretty much okay. Let's check the, the options execution and it's pretty much the, the same thing. Hmm. And let's see the, the other Lambda function that I have and see if it's pretty much the same and load featured well it may be the case that it's not allowing the the requests to fly through so let's test this by adding the access control origin header i think this this might be the case so i'm adding the one more header here just let's get the content and uh, access control orange and save and still missing the authentication token hmm. so let's see yep Well, the request is flying all right through the, through the gateway and not 
no, going through the it's the get test is working all right but i don't know it, why it is rejecting my calls this may be something oh, this is the for the for those for that i the same this or the same request that we did and we can see here that it's getting the headers correctly and making the invocation so it's really api gateway that's rejecting my call and very hard to understand why as authorization is none for both the options and the api gateway both re not requiring an api key and a proxy and oh let's see authorizers no authorizers that's not required hmm let's I make sure this is deployed to prod and hmm. uh, the worst thing is I had this error before I just can't remember what what it is hmm. So let's make sure I added all the steps and I know this is this is correct. Uh, we'll, well, I guess that I will just have to step through this one more time and see if this conf configuration is all right. The function is working perfectly. It's something with the with the API gateway itself. So yeah, let's. I'll have to check this. I really can uh, don't know what's going on here. Uh, we'll probably leave it at this stage and debug this and get back to you guys. So you guys don't have to wait through this or let's do what we do in real life and just check it out if we can find what this is so api gateway and see if there if um, stack overflows saves us or in the forum the aws forum we can we can check if there is anything but i'm pretty sure that we make everything quite correctly I don't know what's going on here. It's probably something very, very simple. Hmm. No, it's not. Not anything like this. But it seems to be pretty common. <laughs> well. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, guys, I don't really know what's going on here. I had this tested like dozens of times, but you know, when you go live, weird these weird things happen. And also, I'm having a bit of some technical issues right now. So yeah let's see featured items versus featured items this could be it but let's copy and paste it see if this is correct so yes it's this is one possibility thanks for that um voila Thank you very much, Avinash. You saved our broadcast today. It was the simplest thing. I, was, I would debug this forever if it was not for you guys. Thank you very much. Love you. And this is usually how it happens. It's 
live coding is always very very fun <laughs> so right now we have the we have the api run up and running and we can go on to integrate it with our uh with our app so how can we do this so we can just generate the the, the client go to that stage and go on to prod and of course that we could just in any javascript app or in curl we can just fire and hit reach our api endpoint and get this information but as i mentioned there are there is retries and security and throttling and a lot of stuff that you want to manage and the sdk the sdk generation does it all for you so i will generate the javascript sdks generate this here and now we have our client library for that when let, let me just move this away for a new folder so make sure this is the correct folder so this is our javascript client and right now we can so akdsk how how does invoke url map to a site url well you can you don't really need this url you can just add this to your javascript requests or it's embedded in the sdk generated for you so you don't really need it but you can map to different custom domains your pro your production stage for example you can set uh you can give other other do other domain names and map this to uh, a different domain with a different certificate we are going to do that in in other episodes one thing that i added here on the description is how to use the generated sdk and here is how one would go about it so let me show how this would work let's go with uh, step by step so i just extracted the the zip i don't we downloaded we already enable cross origin resources and in our web page we need to reference these scripts so though all those scripts are are here so we need to move this to our breakless project breakless react and in the public directory of the no of the react application everything that's here will be published as a static resource so i will go here and copy everything this way we can see here on atom that those files are there and in our index.html we can make we can make those very same references so here is how we do it okay so if it was on the on the web on the on the javascript let's do a, an example on the javascript page on the very same javascript page and add first of course add the script tags so all those are required let's let's remove this comment and i will add it below the title and just add this script tag And here we're going to use our API for a while outside the React code, then we are moving it inside our React code. So API client is now a new client and we can call our methods like this. We can send parameters, we can send a body, 
we can send additional parameters and invoke the function okay I will beautify this just so it's nice and tidy and if it works we're going to uh, let's just comment this for a while and not run it yet so I can show you guys something and um, here on the console if we load let's see if it is all working and here on the network we can see that all those clients are being built and on the console we can call API gateway client and that and see that this is really an object that make me let's make this a bit bigger and here are the operations so you see there's a small change in names there's a different naming standard for that so it's called featured items get on the on the javascript object so this is what we are using here so we learned a very important lesson today do not type always copy and paste so let's just paste this here and if it succeeds we console.log the result or else we console.log the error all right the, and this would be better name error and console.log that and if we check it we have the, that object and in the object we have here the the headers the transform request the response and hmm, and some data right so let's see where is our headers transform response many shows it should be should be here on on data hmm there is our object. So we are invoking the function. We're not not sending any parameters. Let's see if the if the function is getting invoked. So here in monitoring our function seems to be getting involved and where is that request the request is being made to the to the gateway and this is returning OK. Huh. This is weird. Should be all right. Console.log. Success. And let's see if it's. it's actually working so it's creating the let, let me remove those unneeded parameters just make sure this is not interfering and console.log before call and So it is a success. Well, I don't know. It's probably the the extra stuff that was preventing it from working. Now we have those objects here. Okay. And now that we have it, we have the objects set up. We just need to put this on the page. So we can 
go on our React application. And on React, there is a method called component will mount. So React component will mount. So on React components, when a component uh, we have this life cycle for every component when it's added to the page when it's about to be added to the page so when it will mounted uh, or when it did mount we can take actions so when component did mount and that's added to the page let's create this method oops we're going to fire a function so all that will happen when the component mounts on the page just let's log to understand what's going on and component mounted and just making sure that we go step by step and component is there and mounted so we can just set the state of our app and do all this inside our React app. So now on app.js, we can add this to the, the, the one thing that we need to do differently is that we can't reference um, this object directly, it must be on window so here we should have the same behavior so it's the same call the same thing it's just being made uh, outside okay it's just being made by the by the request by the by the react component instead of the html page but it's this very same let's just keep this a bit shorter so we have more screen space And now it's pretty standard React. So we can um, we can add a constructor. It's a very good. I like to show what's the expected state of the app here. But here we can just get the result. The result object has this. So we are interested in the data thing. So we want result dot data so this is the the object that we want and we can just uh, this this here is a different context than this out here so the same trick var that equal this and we should be making new keyboard sorry for that and that dot set state and set the state of our react app to uh, result dot data so now we have this as the state of our app and we can use this state inside the inside the, the app so let's try to use it here for example and just well let's see if we can we can map that we can map those items to to resort to to anything so let me just take a glass of water and we'll do that in a, one minute okay just a second So I do have another app that I built with very similar um, context and we can group from that or we can get the, the mapping code from, from Re React tools. So let me get 
uh, another example from another app and just so I don't have to remember every detail about React. I'm still learning React, I don't know much about it. Just a, this is a preview for the next um, episode around authentication. So one thing that's a good practice is create a constructor with the, with the settings, with the, with the state that you want this is a good one but what I was looking for is this so we set the state of the app we set the state before the the render uh, on render but before return we can get the the feature from the state so here is not the public feature but the name uh, the name of the property is items so this will be items and this is es6 this will just assign to items this dot state dot items okay and using react we can open and map open a, a comp uh, com I, don't, I wouldn't call this a component, but just an expression. This would be probably the best name. And map the items. Each item will be, for example, a new paragraph. So it will be a new P and N, a new paragraph and end paragraph. And here we can do things such as getting the the property so what is the property name that we we use it on the let's just add xxx just make sure that it is still running and hmm something is wrong let's see what something is Restart, restarting React from time to time is probably a good idea, especially when strange things are going on. And oh, another port. And this is on. I don't know why this is failing to compile. Oh yeah, I probably should be using the the React Dev Tools. Uh, I don't have this installed in this browser yet, uh, but this dot state is new, so let's let's check this if on on the on the first call. So on the constructor, we're going to make sure that state is never null, even before it was mounted. So we can do something like this so this dot state i will only need items so now it's not new anymore and props and context is not defined so i this comes from the constructor um, we can we can we have our three new lines and instead of xxx we can probably say that an item maps to a paragraph with item dot what's the name of the property it's item dot id so it's the id of this item it needs escaping on an expression again and voila we have the the data from our api gateway here so let's let's review uh, what we have done here it was quite a scratch and we did it all um, with all by hand without using any frameworks so i guess this 
this can be a bit much, but we're going to, to go and reveal this. Yes, um, it is a bit tedious to write things like that, AKDSK. Um, we are going, we are not going to build the complete application this way. We are going to use more advanced frameworks and tools. I'm just thinking that it is important to understand what's going on behind the hood, uh, even if you're using a framework. So I'd like to make sure that you have all the, the components individually before we start uh, with some magic without understanding what's going on. This is, this is why uh, we're keeping this uh, under the hood. And I agree, Eric, keeping your handler as simple as possible is, is very, very important if you, if you can. And we are going to do this, just test it outside the Lambda function. So just to review what we have done today, um, we can, we, we created this, what's going on right now. So React is running on my computer and when it loads the page, it loads all those files on the index.html on the HTML. And this is the SDK. This API client is the API that API Gateway generated for us. And we are calling that API Within, and you can see here that we don't have to worry uh, about retries and um, a, lo a lot of credentials management, uh, local storage, everything will be handled by the, by, the gate, by the API gateway client that's generated by the SDK. And when we call featured items get, it's, called, it's mapped directly to the get I get method of the featured items resource and that is bound to our lambda function, right? It's bound to this list features function that is going, it's a very simple and static function. It's just, it could be fetching from the database and and authenticating your users and things like that. We are going to do this in the future broadcasts, but for now we're just starting with a very, very simple JSON object. And the response, uh, this response format is very important. This is what um, be, is being passed through API Gateway, and this is what API Gateway uses to under to know what status it should and headers it will send to the client. And in the body, we are shipping that JSON object. And the important thing is that while we are just here talking and not hitting the APIs, it's not costing us anything. It's just sitting there. Our Lambda function is just idle we just need to it's it just costs when we hit refresh and invoke it just this just costed aws a few fractions of a cent i don't think that uh, business will mind <laughs> and and this is it for today's broadcast we just created an api and we could do, be doing anything on our Lambda function and it's going to get much more interesting in the first, in the next broadcasts. I just want to make sure you understand the what React is doing, what API Gateway is doing, what Lambda is doing before we add more complexity. In the next broadcast, we are doing Cognito and we're going to be talking a lot about authentication and authorization because that's pretty uh, important to move to the next step that will be handling data. You want, you want to make sure users are authenticated before handling database requests. So I, I hope you can see how this is building. We started from static con we started with static content and then we moved to an API and next we are going to add authentication and then databases and then advanced live analytics or machine learning or 
whatever kind of requirement that you guys would like to see and i couldn't make this without your help so thank you guys for for tuning in i hope you enjoy here on the twitch uh on the on the on the gist for today's episode let me just put that again and thanks thank you guys for commenting on twitch um and a lot of good suggestions thanks eric hammond for answering and staying here with us AK DSK also very nice comments and I what I'd like to show you is there there are many many tools such as the serverless framework that allows you to much more easily create and deploy those lambda functions there is a um, serverless application model from AWS that turns this into um, these functions into cloud formation templates and you can easily deploy them or an apex that's another um, serverless flame framework so you can go uh, build even go support into your lambda functions and the the features that they have are a bit different and some are better than others for specific use cases i don't want to be to pick favorites here for example chalice is very popular in the python community but i highly recommend you guys take a look at least at, at the serverless framework as that seems to be the the most popular right now and ma really makes it easier to take all those steps and that's probably what we are going to be using for the next functions so we don't have to do this by hand every time but we are definitely going to do this step by step again using the the serverless framework for the next functions that we build into this api i hope you see this api we are going to add many more methods and features and please let me know what requirements you would like to add what kind of app you would like to build and it will be our pleasure to feature this in our future broadcasts thanks for tuning in see you next week